me go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar, Ethically and Possibly STD Research in Guatemala from 1946 to 1948. Um, my name is Dawn Hagland. I'm the Senior Director of Professional Development at the Society for Public Health Education. And on behalf of SOFI, we're pleased with your interest in today's webinar and are thankful that you've taken time out of your day to participate. SOFI is delighted to partner with the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues in a series of three webinars. Today is uh, the second of those three webinars. Uh, before we begin, I want to start with a few housekeeping items. I'd like to encourage you to take down this toll-free number just in case you experience any difficulties with the event today. You can obtain technical support um, anytime during the session by calling the number on your screen. Please note that all the participants today will be muted. Uh, after hearing from our presenter, we will have a question and answer time. Um, you can submit questions anytime during the webinar by typing your question into the Q&A box on the webinar screen. We encourage you to do that um, as you have questions, and we will address them at the end of the, um, the webinar. Sophie values your feedback and asks you to complete a short feedback form that will pop up uh, in your internet browser immediately following today's webinar. Your evaluations of this program help Sophie in planning future webinars and making sure that we're delivering uh, quality uh, education in the future. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived in Sophie's online learning portal, the Center for Online Resources and Education, or CORE for short. Um, the recording will also be made available on the Bioethics Commission's website for free. Uh, for those who wish to receive continuing education hours that have to be purchased through our core, um, core system, so you'll need to go back in and purchase um, this recording. It should be up in the system within the next um, seven business days. Um, the program has been designated for one hour of certified health education specialists and for one hour of CPH renewal credit by the National Board of Public Health Examiners. So we encourage you to visit SOFI's core, create a free core account. Um, there is a $12 charge for national SOFI members and $24 for non-members. The first webinar in this series, which was on ethics and Ebola from last month, is now available in CORE for purchase, for continuing education purchase. For those of you who are not familiar with SOFI, we are a nonprofit organization founded in 1950, dedicated to providing global leadership to the profession of health education and health promotion, and to promote the health of all people. Members include health education professionals and students throughout the United States and internationally. The organization promotes healthy behaviors, healthy communities, and healthy environments through its membership, its network of local chapters, and numerous partnerships with other organizations. SOFI provides leadership to the profession of health education and health promotion through research, quality practice standards, face-to-face, -face, distance education, and advocacy. To learn more, I encourage you to go to the SOFI website at www.sofi.org. On to today's webinar. The presenter for today's webinar is Dr. Karen Mayhar. Uh, Dr. Mayhar currently serves as the Senior Policy and Research Analyst for the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. In addition to her dissertation titled A Virtue Approach to Public Health Ethics in the Department of Philosophy at Michigan State University, she has also published articles on topics of bioethics that include public health ethics and developing a development world bioethics. We are delighted to have her join us today and share the results of a recent bioethics commission report. Dr. Mayer? Thanks, Don, and I just wanted to say thanks to all the folks at SOFI um, for both the kind introduction and also for all your help with the logistics of this presentation.
Um, as mentioned, um, the Bioethics Commission um, is involved with policy in an interdisciplinary field that brings together many forms of expertise. The Bioethics Commission's analysis of the research I'm presenting today is in part historical, a look back at what happened over 60 years ago. It's also an ethical analysis, an evaluation of which values are at stake in research involving human participants uh, and the values that must be upheld if research is to be considered both ethical and successful. To begin with today, I'll start with a general background of how the 1940s research in Guatemala came to light and how it led to the Bioethics Commission's report on these events entitled Ethically Impossible. I'll then provide a more detailed review of the Bioethics Commission's historical counting of events and the review of ethical standards in context. Lastly, I'll conclude with some additional information regarding how you can use the Bioethics Commission's website www.bioethics.gov to find more resources, including educational materials. First, a little background about the Bioethics Commission, this SOFI webinar series, and the discovery of the U.S.-supported 1940s research in Guatemala. First of all, the, bio, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues is an advisory panel of the nation's leaders in medicine, science, ethics, religion, law, and engineering. Each presidential bioethics commission is established by executive order, and members are appointed by the president. The current bioethics commission was established by President Barack Obama in 2009 to advise the president on matters of ethics, science, technology, and health policy. The bioethics commission is a federal advisory commission meeting at least four times a year. It, it deliberates in public and submits its recommendations to the president in publicly available reports. As Don mentioned, this webinar is the second in a three-part series on public health bioethics. This series features three of the Bioethics Commission's reports relevant to those with an interest in the ethics of public health research and practice. Part one of this series covered the Bioethics Commission's report, Ethics and Ebola, Public Health Planning and Response. This first webinar in the series took place in March, and if you're interested in the report, the archive is available on the SOFI website. This presentation is the second webinar in the series, addressing the Bioethics Commission's report entitled Ethically Impossible. This report concerns research ethics violations concerning the U.S. government-sponsored research that took place during the 1940s in Guatemala. Briefly, the 1940s research in Guatemala addressed by the Bioethics Commission involved two different kinds of experiments that occurred during this period. The first were intentional exposure experiments that occurred um, from 1947 to 1948. Individuals from many vulnerable populations were exposed, including commercial sex workers, prisoners, psychiatric patients, and soldiers. Individuals were exposed to various different infectious diseases, including gonorrhea, syphilis, and chancroid. Exposure methods included sexual intercourse, skin contact, injection, scarification and abrasion, and cisternal puncture. The second kind of experiments were serology studies, including blood draws, lumbar punctures, and cisternal punctures. I'll expand on each type of these research in a moment. But first, it's important to acknowledge that most research ethics teaching starts with lessons in history, and this case is no different. The uncovering of the unconscionable experiments began with this, the discovery of a set of documents in a library. Dr. John C. Cutler, the researcher who directed the studies in Guatemala during the 1940s, donated his records to the University of Pittsburgh archives in 1990 toward the end of his career. They went undiscovered in the archives for over 10 years. Then, in 2003, historian and professor Susan Reverby of Wellesley College discovered these documents while working on a book about the syphilis study in the United States that took place in Tuskegee, Alabama. In 2010, she presented her work to colleagues at the American Association for the History of Medicine. She also contacted colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control to apprise them of her uncovering of this course of events in Guatemala. The Bioethics Commission's analysis of what unfolded in Guatemala was prompted by this discovery and subsequent public revelation of records documenting the experiments. 
Following the discovery of this research, President Barack Obama extended an apology to then President of Guatemala, Alvaro Colom, and the people of Guatemala on October 1, 2010. Kathleen Sebelius, then Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, who was Secretary of State, immediately issued a joint apology to the Guatemalan people and the survivors and descendants of those affected. In November of 2010, President Barack Obama charged the Bioethics Commission to undertake a thorough review of what occurred during the, the experiments, noting that these events constituted what he called a sobering reminder of past abuses. At the end of 2010, the Cutler documents were transferred to the U.S. National Archives with copies sent to the Bioethics Commission to inform their analysis. The Bioethics Commission's final report on the STD research in Guatemala was completed in September 2011. The report is entitled Ethically Impossible and is publicly available for download in both English and Spanish at the website bioethics.gov. In addition, the Bioethics Commission produced a companion study guide to facilitate instructors who want to use these events to teach students about the history of research ethics violations. This companion study guide is also available in English and Spanish at the website bioethics.gov under the Education tab, and I'll talk about it in more detail later in the presentation. The first step of the Bioethics Commission's analysis was to undertake a thorough historical accounting of events. This meant attempting to determine what had taken place decades earlier, using the information available in the archived documents as well as publicly available information. To complete its analysis of events at the time, the Bioethics Commission reviewed over 125,000 pages of original records and 550 published documents. During the next section, I will focus on what they found primarily through the archives of John Cutler, called the Cutler Documents, for short. These archives included experimental notebooks, note cards documenting procedures and test results by subject, and final reports, which helped piece together a sequence of events. I return later in the presentation to what the archived correspondence revealed. As evidenced by these public health posters, STDs were viewed as undermining national defense at the time. On the left, a poster proclaims that sex without prophylaxis is pro-access, highlighting the importance of the World War II context that was um, slightly preceded these experiments. On the right, the machine that is the U.S. war effort is being sabotaged by an enemy agent, venereal disease, depicted as a ghostly skeleton. The Bioethics Commission's report aims not only to detail these events that unfolded in association with the research in Guatemala, but to contextualize as much as could be known at the time about experiments that took place over 60 years before their ethical analysis took place. As these posters indicate, these experiments occurred in the late 1940s as World War II was drawing to a close. STDs had long been a concern of the U.S. government. For example, in 1938, U.S. Surgeon General Thomas Perrin testified before Congress in support of proposed legislation to expand funding for public health prevention efforts and research in this field. At the beginning of World War II, STDs posed a major obstacle to members of the military and therefore the success of their efforts. Although World War II was coming to an end, the STD research in Guatemala was seen by those who knew and supported it not only um, as an important novel and scientific advancement, but also as an ongoing endeavor to support and advance military operations. There are other chapters of U.S. history that are pertinent to placing the research in Guatemala in context. It is common to start any course in research ethics with historical examples like the lessons learned from the 1940s Guatemala STD experiments. These terrible events help to explain why we have the system of regulatory oversight for research involving human participants that we have today. But precisely because this example often raises the specter of the U.S. syphilis experiments in Tuskegee, Alabama, it's important to clarify both the similarities and the differences between the experiments. 
When it comes to similarities, both kinds of experiments involved some of the same people, including John Cutler, who led the Guatemala STD experiment in the 1940s and whose archive documents are a major source of our knowledge about what happened. Cutler was later involved in the Tuskegee syphilis study in the 1950s. The projects were also both overseen by the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, VDRL, of the Public Health Service. In both the 1940s in Guatemala and throughout the experiments in Tuskegee, Alabama, participants were deliberately deceived by researchers and information was withheld from the public. Both types of research took place against a backdrop of racial beliefs and attitudes, especially since disproven theories about differences in racial physiology that affect disease progression. In addition, attitudes regarding the sexual promiscuity of African Americans, Latino Americans, and Indian Americans also set the stage for selection of vulnerable populations. Other factors, however, distinguished the 1940s research in Guatemala from the research violations that occurred in Tuskegee, Alabama. The most important of these is location. The research in Guatemala ended long before the work in Tuskegee stopped and took place over a much shorter period. Importantly, subjects in Guatemala were deliberately exposed to infection. In contrast, those in Tuskegee, Alabama were already infected with syphilis when the study began and were left untreated, some for as long as 30 years, despite the availability of effective treatment like penicillin. To talk about the research experiments in Guatemala in more detail, uh, it's important to think about the initial experimental design that researchers approached these experiments with. In particular, researchers believed that the legality of commercial sex work in Guatemala would facilitate learning more about normal exposure to syphilis, including the possibility for reinfection after treatment with penicillin or superinfection with multiple strains of syphilis. Researchers, including John Cutler and Juan Funes, a Guatemalan physician, were also interested in studying different methods of STD prophylaxis, including comparing penicillin to the preferred method of the day, Orvis mefarsin, a wash for prevention of both syphilis and gonorrhea. In addition, the study goals included prolonged observation of those treated with penicillin to cure syphilis in order to better understand the effects of such treatment. To provide additional details, I'll now speak more about the intentional exposure experiments in particular. These took place from 1947 to 1948. Subjects exposed included commercial sex workers, psychiatric patients at a National Psychiatric Hospital of Guatemala, soldiers in the Guatemalan Army, and prisoners, many of whom were indigenous Guatemalans. As mentioned, subjects were exposed to different STDs, including gonorrhea, syphilis, and chancroid. Importantly, STD exposure was focused on certain populations. For example, exposure to gonorrhea was primarily took place with the involvement of members of the Guatemalan military. But some subjects were exposed to multiple diseases at different points during the research. Subjects were exposed through various different methods, including sexual intercourse with commercial sex workers, skin contact, including inoculation of genitalia, scarification and abrasion of subjects' penises, and cisternal puncture. For example, syphilis was injected into the spinal fluid at the base of some subjects' skulls. The Bioethics Commission's review of the historical records of these experiments enabled them to painstakingly piece together a sequence of events as pictured in this timeline. In the pink column on the far left, the timeline depicts how experiments involving exposure to gonorrhea began early in 1947 and were especially common among members of the Guatemalan military. Meanwhile, the central columns in blue and yellow depict how syphilis exposure experiments started somewhat later among prisoners and psychiatric patients. Stankroid exposure began yet later, in 1948, among patients in a psychiatric hospital and is not pictured on this truncated version of the timeline, but you can view the entire full timeline in an appendix from the report online. Next, I'll discuss in more detail the second kind of experiments, the serology studies. These were performed both concurrently and long after the exposure studies concluded, extending from 1946 to 1953. 
These studies attempted to perform diagnostic testing among orphans, school children, leprosarian patients, U.S. servicemen in Guatemala, as well as all those same populations involved in intentional exposure research. Serology testing included blood draws, lumbar punctures, and cisternal punctures. John Cutler left Guatemala in 1948 at the end of the exposure studies. After his departure, the serology studies continued under the supervision of Dr. Funes and Dr. Carlos Salvado, a director of the psychiatric hospital, and with continued funding from the U.S. government. Some serology studies samples were shipped back to the United States for analysis, and data recording the observations were submitted to the Public Health Service through at least 1953. Pictured here is a map of where the 1940s experiment in Guatemala took place. While many experiments took place in Guatemala City, serology experiments occurred in these other locations noted on the larger map of the country below. At the time, serology studies were considered important to conduct because of lack of reliable means of diagnosing individual patients with syphilis. This also entailed difficulty detecting background rates of infection among populations complicating intentional exposure experiments which needed to detect new cases. The investigators focused primarily on the effectiveness of four specific flood tests, the Kahn, Mazzini, Colmer, and BDRL slide tests. For these serology tests, blood was drawn and subjected to one or more different syphilis testing methods that would indicate whether the blood contained antibodies against syphilis. Lumbar and cisternal punctures were also sometimes conducted to confirm the results of a blood test or to look for infection in the spinal fluid that might not have been found using a blood test. I will discuss in a moment how such studies were conducted without consent, often involving deliberate deception of subjects who provided the biospecimen samples. In addition, there are other ethically relevant considerations that informed the Bioethics Commission's analysis of the serology studies. First, the pain induced as a result of such procedures is a core concern when evaluating the harms and risks posed to subjects as a result of such research. Second, researchers were aware, although dismissive, of cultural beliefs that made many subjects resistant to the efforts to withdraw their blood. The meaning of vital fluids within a community is as important as physical injuries when we try to understand the degree and extent of harm involved in the serology studies in addition to the extreme um, harm caused by the intentional exposure research. John C. Cutler is a central figure of the Bioethics Commission's report on the 1940s STD research in Guatemala, particularly because it is his records that he left to the University of Pittsburgh Library. These records uncover these events and highlight his role particularly because they are drawn from his own correspondence. Nevertheless, there were many other individuals and groups involved in the research, including the agencies who received regular reports. Listed here are the scientists who formed the research team in Guatemala, including several Guatemalan physicians. There was also a chain of command or structure of authorization of the research, both in advance and as it proceeded. Pictured here is the syphilis study section. This group exemplifies the restructuring of research grants housed in the U.S. National Institutes of Health taking place at the time. The group approved the research in Guatemala at its very first meeting in February of 1946. Listed here are other leaders, including then Surgeon General Thomas Perrin, all of whom knew of or directly supervised the research as it took place. Several agencies provided support in the form of organizational infrastructure, administrative services and logistics, or resources. The point here is not to provide a definitive and exhaustive list of those to blame. Rather, the extensiveness of support and widespread expert knowledge of the 1940s STD research in Guatemala demonstrates that many at the time made such research possible, and that responsibility for what happened cannot be laid at the feet of any single person or even one institution. Moreover, although many individuals and organizations contributed to making the research possible, the deliberate attempts of some of those involved to contain information of the details of the research, it's also not clear who knew what was occurring at the time or after the research was concluded. 
This table provides an overview of the Bioethics Commission's historical account of events that occurred in Guatemala. In sum, the intentional exposure experiments and serology experiments combined involved over 5,000 people, the cell at the very top right. Below this, the box indicates that the, ad, the age of subjects ranged all the way from young children to elderly adults. Lastly, I'll emphasize the box on the bottom right, which focuses on the exposure experiments. Overall, 1,308 people were intentionally exposed to one or more STD during the course of research. Records at the time were far from complete, but document that 678, or approximately half of the individuals of this group, received some form of treatment. The incompleteness of records and the indeterminate causal relationship to intentional infection makes it impossible to determine how many individuals were infected directly as a result of exposure and how many were subsequently effectively treated to address such infections. John Cutler's contemporaneous records note 83 deaths during the course of the experiments. The exact relationship between the experimental procedures and the subject's death is yet again unclear. John Cutler attributed these deaths primarily to tuberculosis and the fact that both acute and chronically ill patients were involved in, as subjects. But there remains the deeply disturbing possibility that some of these deaths were not only avoidable, but a direct result of the experimental exposure. After establishing the sequence of events concerning the 1940s STD experiments in Guatemala, the Bioethics Commission then turned to an ethical analysis of these events. In this section, we return to their review of ethical standards in context. In the Commission's view, the experiments in Guatemala involved unconscionable violations of ethics, even as judged against the researcher's understanding of the practice and requirements of research ethics of the day. Many of their actions disregarded principles and um, widely accepted as applicable across time, as well as the standards of our own time that are embodied in the ethics and regulation of biomedical research today. This analysis is based on a conceptual and historical consideration of values and norms, as well as facts elicited primarily from the correspondence found among John Cutler's records that I'm going to be highlighting. The 1940s STD research in Guatemala preceded the extensive establishment of research ethics and regulatory oversight infrastructure, which took place in the 1970s. However, even at the time, there was a basic conception of voluntary consent and an understanding of differential vulnerability in various populations. For example, John Cutler and others who were aware of the research in Guatemala were partly supportive of such research because of previous research conducted from 1943 to 1944 at a U.S. penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. During this research, prisoners were intentionally exposed to gonorrhea. A main difference, however, was that researchers were quite cognizant of the need to establish informed and voluntary consent. Terre Haute prisoners were provided with a document called a waiver, describing the risks of research, including information about the intent to expose them by applying the germ to the end of the penis, the possibility of failure from modern treatment methods, and side effects from presently available treatments. While these practices would likely not pass muster for ethical informed consent to research among the vulnerable population of prisoners today, the research provides a stark contrast with what happened only years later in Guatemala. As I will detail in a moment, research in researchers in Guatemala intentionally deceived research subjects and were dismissive of their vulnerability. Racism, too, played a role in the researcher's view of disclosure. For example, in this correspondence from John Cutler to one of his supervisors, Dr. Richard C. Arnold, he mentions that some of the Guatemalan prisoners referred to by the researchers as Indians did not even need to have the research, ex research explained to them, quote, as they are only confused by explanations and knowing what is happening, unquote. This observation reveals the influence of racial beliefs and attitudes on both researchers' perceptions of participants and how this translated into their research practices. Some of those aware of the research expressed reservations given the selection of vulnerable populations. In this correspondence, the same supervisor, Richard Arnold, says he is a bit 
in fact, more than a bit leery of the experiment with insane people as they, quote, cannot give consent and do not know what is going on. He appears primarily concerned with the exposure to criticism because he goes on to say, quote, if some goody organization got wind of the work, they would raise a lot of smoke, unquote. However, Arnold notes, it appears hopefully that, a, that, quote, a patient or a dozen could be infected, develop the disease, and be cured before anything could be suspected. Your first study could be done in a short time and none would be the wiser, unquote. He advises John Cutler not to mention where the work was done, who the subjects were in the final report, and ends with a warning to be sure all the angles have been covered. John Cutler and others also discussed the using of the provision of treatment and medical supplies as ways to build local goodwill and also as a cover for their experiments. John Cutler noted in one letter regarding research at, at, among psychiatric patients that even he was having trouble keeping the story straight um, as they were not telling the subjects involved that there was an experiment underway. He noted, we are explaining to patients and to others concerned, but with a few key exceptions, that the treatment is a new one utilizing serum followed by penicillin. This double talk keeps me hopping at times. The Biotics Commission emphasized how these researchers knowingly violated ethical standards of their own time. In particular, the researchers' concerns about public exposure as opposed to the welfare of the participants, influenced the commission's choice of the report title, Ethically Impossible. This phrase comes from a 1947 New York Times note published by the science editor Waldemar Kempfert. Reporting on syphilis penicillin prophylaxis research in rabbits by a Dr. Harry Eagle, Kempfert observed that the rabbits were undergoing intentional exposure, which was not a tenable option for humans. He noted, quote, the case holds good for rabbits, but no tests on human beings have yet been made. To settle the human issue quickly, it would be necessary to shoot living syphilis germs into human bodies, just as Dr. Eagle shot them into rabbits. Since this is ethically impossible, it may take years to gather the information needed. Eight days after the publication of the note in the New York Times, Dr. John F. Mahoney, head of the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, wrote Dr. Cutler to say that the same Dr. Eagle mentioned in this note was, despite his conclusion in the New York Times, very eager to join the Guatemala research team given his findings in rabbits. In this letter, Dr. Mahoney opposed allowing Dr. Eagle to join the research team in Guatemala. He also expressed some concerns about the possibility that the research might need an advisory group of leading figures for fear that they might be obstructive to the research continuing. He even suggested selecting members of such a group strategically, so such an advisory group come to pass. He requested that Dr. Cutler destroy the letter. Kemper's New York Times note was of particular interest to Dr. Cutler and his colleagues. Having planned precisely the experiment Kemper described as being ethically impossible, only weeks later, Cutler wrote back to John Mahoney. In this letter, he echoed concerns to avoid public scrutiny of the research. Citing the Kemfert piece, Cutler writes, quote, it is becoming just as clear to us as it appears to be to you that it would not be advisable Dr. Mayhar, did we lose you? Um, we may have lost her there in um, the phone for just a moment. I'll ask you to bear with me for a second and we'll see if we can get her back. Dr. Mayhar? Mm -hmm. 
I apologize. We'll keep working to try and get her back here and uh, finish the presentation. I ask for your patience for just a moment. Hello? There you are, yes. I'm not sure what happened, but... Oh, sorry. I can... How long have I been gone for? <laughs> um, you were um, just going on to your 40, the slide 40, um, just finishing up the one before. So uh, there was a brief sound maybe from your phone, I'm not sure, and then you went silent for a moment. So glad to have you back. Oh, yeah, great. I'm glad that I wasn't gone for too long there. <laughs> okay, so um, if we would just review a little bit, um, this, uh, this is the New York Times article that comes out calling the research ethically impossible. Um, and then a whole slew of letters start coming back and forth between people worried that the research is going to come under scrutiny that's going to shut it down. So here we have... Um, another letter. So Kemper's New York Times note was of particular interest to Dr. Cutler and his colleagues, um, having planned precisely the experiment that Kemper described as ethically impossible. Only weeks later, Cutler wrote back to John Mahoney, and in this letter he echoed the concerns to avoid public scrutiny of the research. Citing the Kemper piece, Cutler writes, it is becoming just as clear to us as it appears, as it appears to be to you that it would not be advisable to have too many people concerned with this work in order to keep down talk and premature writing. We are just a bit concerned about the possibility of having anything said about our program that would adversely affect its continuation. There's also evidence that the study site selection of Guatemala was knownly viewed as a way of getting around ethical, legal, or public concerns that might arise in the United States. In this letter written by one of Cutler's colleagues at the Public Health Service, he observes that awareness of the research reached the highest levels, including Dr. Thomas Perrin, then Surgeon General. He writes, I saw Dr. Perrin on Friday. He was familiar with all the arrangements and wanted to be brought up to date on what progress had been made. As you well know, he is very much interested in this project, and a merry twinkle came in his eye when he said, you know, we couldn't do such an experiment in this country. Prior to 2010, Dr. Perrin had been recognized as a leader in public health achievement for his work in bringing attention to sexually transmitted diseases at a time when they were little discussed in American society. The discovery that he approved the research in Guatemala recently led the American Sexually Transmitted Disease Association, the ASTDA, to rename their Thomas Perrin Lifetime Achievement Award in 2013. It is now renamed the ASTDA Distinguished Career Award. In conclusion, today's researchers are frequently well aware of how we must learn from the past. Trust of community members is central to public health interventions and research, and the shadows cast by these dark chapters of history are lasting. The Bioethics Commission's commitment to identifying the full facts in this case will help ensure, going forward, that current rules for research participants protect people from harm or unethical treatment wherever research occurs. Moreover, recognition of the full extent of harm and injustice done to other communities in the past is the first and most important step in making amends. 60 years is a long period for such serious course of events to remain unknown. The Bioethics Commission is particularly committed to outreach, to connecting with stakeholders with an interest in these events and their analysis provided in the report, Ethically Impossible. As a part of their outreach efforts, the Bioethics Commission has produced companion educational materials for each of their reports. I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that if you are interested, you can find these in the education section of our website, that's www.bioethics.gov education. Here, I have provided a list of the educational materials that accompany Ethically Impossible, the report. As a reminder, if you are using the events that took place in Guatemala to provide students or colleagues with an update on topics in research ethics, 
the companion study guide is a particularly useful resource and is available in both English and in Spanish. The study guide features sections that can be pulled out to focus in on one dimension of the research, such as the section on vulnerable populations. Each section also features a comment, which offers a series of questions that can guide discussion, and a list of recommended reading to help expand or direct studies. In addition to our website, please connect with us on social media, our blog, on Twitter, and on YouTube. I look forward to your questions now, but if you think of something later, and I always do, please feel free to reach out to us over email. Our email address is info at bioethics.gov, and I'll hand it over um, to you, Don, to find out if we have um, some time here to field some questions from our attendees. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mayhar. Um, again, thank you uh, for your presentation. And again, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A chat box on your screen. I encourage you to type in a question, and we can spend a few minutes um, answering those here um, before the end of the hour. Uh, the only question I have right now is, are there international courts investigating such abuse as criminal behavior. I'm not sure if they're reflecting on the what had happened um, or maybe how it was handled now that it's been public. Um, I'm not sure um, regarding an update on the legal state of affairs. Um, I will say that um, there was an independent investigation and an independent report done by the country of Guatemala. And was there an outcome or? Um, I think they have a report. I don't know if it's as publicly available as our own. Okay. Okay. Um, we can wait just another moment for um, additional questions. Um, thank you for the clear presentation. I know it's a lot to cover in a short amount of time. I'm curious if there's anything you'd like to draw attention to or expand upon given a few additional minutes. Um, I think that um, it is a lot to process. Um, and I think a lot of um, people in public health are, per are particularly interested in um, the comparison to what happened in Tuskegee, Alabama in the United States. And so that's why we have that compare contrast slide, um, which I might be able to pull up here. Yeah, right here. Um, and so um, I know that there's also much better research. Um, because this research in Guatemala just came to light, we have much better research, and because um, Tuskegee, Alabama was in the United States, about how that um, uncovering of events affected the contemporary kind of trust that communities have um, in researchers today. And so I think that sometimes we get questions about whether or not we think this kind of revelation um, has affected community trust uh, in researchers going forward. And I think the answer is always yes, insofar as it continues to add to our understanding of how these things have happened in the past. Um, but we definitely have much less information, and certainly there's um, currently less awareness, I think, amongst the communities affected, um, Guatemalan Americans, um, about these events. Yeah, great. Um, I do have another question. Is the national defense approach to infectious diseases still ethically problematic? How can this past research and the commission's report inform our approach to STDs such as HIV and possibly Zika virus? Oh, those are really great questions. So I think I think it's important um, in all a lot of research ethics, especially for those people who are teaching it. Um, raises these questions of the social value of the research versus the risk that we're posing to participants. Um, and so I think when we're, each of us, that the point of listing all of the different people who knew at least something about this research happening and all the different organizations that helped contribute to it happening is to make us all aware of the way in which our contemporary context can influence how we perceive risk. Uh, and, and also the importance of a particular research undertaking. And so I think uh, that is partly why we have IRB oversight right now, is, is in order to try and um, take someone who isn't in charge of the research or isn't in charge of even that area of research, right? So this re research was overseen by other people who were researchers in public health 
and in STD research. So they were very interested in seeing it go forward. And I think trying to have other researchers who sit on IRBs and people who aren't even researchers who sit on those is a way to gain some perspective to say, hey, are the risks that we're asking people to take really worth the knowledge that's going to be gained? And I also think that Biosis Commission emphasized that the knowledge gained from this kind of design, if you look um, in the report, you'll see that even the purpose of the research is changing over time. And so I think the, the questions of designing your experiments to have rigor so that the knowledge that we're gaining is really worth the risks that we're asking participants to undertake is also an important key point of the Biosis Commission's analysis, the point that um, to even, um, that even designing good science makes for good ethics. Great, I think you may have just answered this question um, related to the IRBs, but um, another question was, I realize research is important, but how does the government handle requests for human test subjects? Is IRB the only avenue for that? Um, so uh, that's certainly um, an, an element of what we do to protect research, um, research participants. And so one thing that's really important is that um, the Bioethics Commission was charged with this particular project um, by the president at the time, but his request was not merely for an historical um, overview of these events. So this is actually one of two different reports that the Bioethics Commission released on human subjects research protection. And the second, which followed this report, is called Moral Science. And it's available on the website as well, bioethics.gov. And that report was a question that the President posed to the Bioethics Commission to take a look at our current system of protections um, and ask the question, could a thing like this ever happen today? And so that's a look at any kind of research that's being supported by the U.S. government across agencies and asking where are the holes, how has research practices, how have they changed, Why are we, how are we doing different kinds of research today that we weren't doing 60 years ago that might create different kinds of questions for how things might go wrong. Uh, and in addition to some of the recommendations provided in that report to improve the regulatory oversight, um, there are also recommendations in there about helping researchers be aware of their ethical obligations and aware of the ethical principles that underlie those regulations because regulatory oversight can't do all of the work. It really works in complement to ethical principles and individuals' moral compass and critical thinking on moral issues in order to be aware of their own biases. And also, um, really, it's researchers who are on the ground who are working with participants every day. And so there's absolutely no way that someone looking um, at the research from a distance can do um, all, can bear all of the responsibility. That also falls on researchers as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have one last comment and a related question. So it says um, this discussion involves life value. This behavior is not unique to U.S. medical research. The greater issue is how we value the life of others. Is the United States public health planning to compensate the children of the indigenous populations? I'm assuming he means the Guatemala participants. So compensation um, for research injury was addressed um, in the Biofix Commission's report, Moral Science. So if people are interested in compensation, it's definitely a big talk of um, a big conversation that's happening in research ethics communities today. Mm -hmm. um, Although that's much about um, participants who are contemporarily injured during the course of research. And so what the question is asking is more about um, the descendants. And as far as I know, um, I'm very unaware of any kind of legal case um, for um, descendants. Um, but I'm certain that other people um, are looking into that. Okay. I do not have any other questions here waiting. Um, I appreciate your um, responses. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? And then I'll just end with a few other thoughts. Um, so I would just welcome people to check out our website. I mentioned the educational materials that are companions to the Guatemala report that the Biosis Commission released. There are others up there for moral science, the additional report that talks about the current system in place. and um, 
as this is part of a series of all the different Bioethics Commission um, reports that are relevant to a public health audience, I really do encourage people who, especially if you have teaching responsibilities or if you um, want to just come up to date on uh, issues in research ethics, there's a lot of um, different types of things that are available there that can uh, help various different audiences have a conversation or um, just give you a summary of issues um, that are arising today. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mayher. I appreciate your presentation today. Thank you all for participating. Uh, just a few quick closing things. Um, uh, we just uh, just a note that uh, if you'd like continuing education for CHES, MCHES, or CPH, you can purchase that after um, this webinar is available on the SOFI Core webpage. And just an encouragement for those of you who are interested in um, this topic, we have one more in our series with the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. That webinar is scheduled for May 25th at the same time, 2 to 3 o'clock Eastern, and we will be looking at a May released report from the Bioethics Commission on bioethics education in the context of public health. So we hope that you plan to join us now. Um, you can go to the SOFI website for um, registration. And um, thank you for attending today and your presentation, and this ends the webinar for today. Thank you.